Hello everyone, and now we're moving on to open channel hydraulics. What you're going to find is quite a bit, a bit of the material will sound familiar to you because this is a continuation of fluid mechanics from last semester or whenever you took the course. Towards the end of fluid mechanics, we started to talk about open channel flow. So terms such as Manning's equation, hydraulic radius, wetted perimeter, brood number, all of these will come back as we start looking at open channel hydraulics as it applies to um, the cross sections of a, say, a waterway, the flow through a weir and a spillway, and those are the topics we are going to look at today. So going through our objectives, first, since it has been probably a few months, perhaps even maybe longer than that, since we have done open channels, we'll go over open channel terms. Then we're going to spend quite a bit of time performing a standard step analysis in order to determine what we call a Water, water stage elevation. So again, that's also known as a WSEL. That will be very similar, actually extremely similar to your homework in which you're going to perform your own standard step analysis for the waterway that you have been working on. Then we're going to calculate flows into gutters and over weirs. And then finally, we're going to do a brief overview of different aspects of culvert design. Typically, culvert design is, re is reserved more for, say, an advanced topic or a graduate topic, but there's just some aspects that you may want to keep in mind in case you work on a project. So the first thing we, we said we're going to do is review some open channel key terms. The first is the term conveyance. This is essentially the flow that could be passing through a cross section of a river. So as you can see here, you have an area, a flow area, and since Q is equal to V times A, this is the flow that could pass, or the conveyance, or the flow that can be conveyed through that cross section. The water surface elevation, or WSEL, is the free surface of the cross section. Now, this, this can vary depending on the different types of flow that you're looking for. Typically, you're looking at the flow for a particular type of storm event such as the 100-year storm, the 50-year storm, the 500-year storm, and that elevation will depend on the flow of that storm. Now, what you're going to find is when you're doing a standard step, step analysis is you're trying to calculate what that water elevation would be, particularly for flooding purposes. Now, two other terms that we'll look at are the floodplain, and this is the amount of land that's inundated typically by the 100-year storm. So, again, a key term is the 100-year storm. So as an example here, this is typically considered a floodplain. These are known as the left outer bank, so that's what LOB stands for. And on the right side, this is the right outer bank. And again, this is the area that is typically not normally uh, flooded by, the, by a flow. This is what would be typically a flood from the 100-year flow. A floodway is the amount of flow under normal conditions. So again, the 100-year storm is considered a storm event, so this does not occur often. But the floodway is your typical flow. So typically, your floodway would have an elevation that looks approximately like this. So that would mean that this area is typically touched by the flood. So this is wetted by the flood by the floodway under normal conditions. The next term is called the thaw leg. The thaw leg is just the, the term used to define the deepest portion of a water cross section. And that's usually towards the center of the section. Again, as we had mentioned, the left over bank. This is if you're looking from the direction downstream. So again, if we're looking towards this cross section right now, the next section should be at a lower elevation downstream. So again, just to keep your left and right straight, this becomes important when you start to model or if you start to do the hand calculations for the standard set method. So you want to make sure you keep your left and your right clear. Now, what is the standard step method? Again, the purpose, and going back to our previous slide just to remember, the purpose is to calculate the water stage elevation for each cross section in the waterway that we're considering. 
to do that, you technically work backwards. You start from um, a downstream section and you work your way upstream. So in order to do that, and again, here's the general outline of what we're going to do. Then we'll explain some of the terms that are new. And then we're going to do a detailed example that's straight from your textbook. So that way, if you'd like, you can follow along in your textbook and take notes as opposed to going through and writing all of the hand calculations. The hand calculations do take a significant amount of time. That's why I want to show you what the benefit is of using computer software to help you, make, to help you do these calculations more efficiently. So what is the general procedure in order to find the water stage elevation at each cross section? Well, the first thing you have to do is you have to start with a known or an assumed downstream water elevation. Usually, we have water gauges or stream gauges at particular points along a, a waterway. So usually, that's where we start because we have some known information. So usually, you start with a known water surface elevation, and then you work your way backwards from there, moving upstream to each cross section. Then what you need to do is for knowing that water stage elevation, that will enable you to find properties such as cross-sectional area, hydraulic radius, and Manning's N. So going back to our previous slide, let's go through those terms real quick. So once you assume a water stage elevation, such as this, that will allow you to determine the total cross-sectional area, because you'll have the points along the channel. You'll have the elevations and the locations. You'll also be able to find the hydraulic radius, because remember, the hydraulic radius is area divided by wetted perimeter. So notice you will know what the wetted perimeter is, although you'll often have to estimate it, because we're usually doing a natural channel. And then Manning's N will depend on what the surface of the stream bed is like. So again, perhaps in the main channel, you might have more of a rocky or um, sandy or a silty type of space. Where along the floodway, I'm sorry, along the floodplain, you may have more like weeds, trees, brush, and that will be a different Manning's end. Once you've determined some of the properties of the channel, you're going to estimate some energy losses so that you can determine the total energy, which will allow you to determine the water stage elevation upstream. So you need to estimate the frictional head loss, and that'll be done using Darcy's equation. Darcy's equation you had from last semester. Then you're also going to do another term, which is you're going to correct the velocity head or the kinetic energy head. And that's the alpha term that we're going to need to calculate. I'll explain that more in just a moment. And then finally, we're going to estimate friction loss due to expansion or contraction of the channel. Again, I'll explain that in a, in a slide in a moment and ex just to show you more about these different terms. So going quickly over some different terms, just remember Manning's N. Oftentimes last semester we worked with man-made materials such as plastic, iron, uh, concrete, and these were the Manning's N values that we used. Now if you'll notice we'll be moving more towards natural channels. So you'll want to use your judgment for the homework to determine what is the best Manning's N. So again, you'll need to determine Manning's N for the main portion of the channel. So again, here are some examples. Also, when you go to do HECRAS, you'll be able to estimate it further because they have an even larger table to help you estimate N. We talked about another term called velocity distribution. What does that mean? Now, last semester, when we were in fluid mechanics, we typically said the average velocity. But again, the velocity profile in an open channel is different from that of a pipe. So here's an example to the right. So if you have flow moving through your channel, notice that the highest velocities are at the free surface because they experience the least amount of friction. The only thing that they're touching is the air above. Where as you go down towards the stream bed, the flow at the stream bed experiences the greatest friction. So it turns out the velocity is very minimal, if not near zero. So what is the appropriate velocity to be used? And again, we want to adjust our velocity head or our kinetic energy head to appropriately reflect how much energy is moving through the system due to the velocity. So 
So to do that, we're going to multiply the kinetic energy v squared on 2j on 2g by alpha, which is a correction factor. Well, how do you calculate alpha? Alpha is equal to the total area. So again, you're going to add the area due to the left outer bank, the main channel, and the right outer bank together. So that's your total area divided by the total conveyance. So that is the total flow that moves through all three sections. And then you're going to look at the individual values of k divided by a. So again, it's k cubed divided by a squared. And we'll do this as an example in the problem. The other term we spoke about is a coefficient for contraction or expansion. Now, just to describe what's happening here, if it turns out that from downstream to upstream, so say, for example, you have a cross section such as this, and the flow is moving down the screen. So this is your flow Q. We're going to name our cross sections, let's say, 3, 2, and 1. You always want to move your higher cross sections from upstream to downstream. So again, as you can see here, cross section 3 is upstream down to a lower number, which is cross section number 1. Now, if, so I'm going, as an example, let's look from cross section 2 to cross section 1. As you notice, the flow moves from cross section 2 to cross section 1, it gets contracted, meaning the area gets smaller. If the area gets smaller, the velocity goes up. And in that contraction, especially around the corners here, you're going to experience additional friction as the flow contracts. So if that's the case, you're going to see a positive difference between the downstream and upstream velocity heads, which means you want to use a co coefficient of contraction. So again, that's your C sub C. Now, the value of C sub C is assumed to be 0.1. Now, if you see the reverse, say, for example, from cross section 3 to cross section 2, here you notice that the flow expands suddenly, which means that you're going from a higher velocity to a slower velocity because you're going from a smaller area to a larger area. And in that process, again, or in the rounding of the corners, you're going to see additional frictional loss that you want to account for. If that's the case, you should see a negative difference from the downstream, cross section 2, to cross section 3, velocity head. So again, your velocity head or your kinetic energy head should be negative, in which case you want to use a coefficient of expansion equal to 0.3. So that will determine your energy loss. Again, we're going to do all of this in the next example. So now moving to our first example where we go through in much detail the standard step method. Now one thing I do suggest, either if you have your textbook or in Blackboard, I've scanned a copy of these pages for you for Chapter 3. I'd recommend you have this out with you so that if you would like to take notes, or at least to follow along in the calculations in that way, I highly recommend it. If you have the ability to print the pages and make notes, I recommend this even more because you'll find that there are some typographical errors in the calculations. There's quite a few. As you can see, I've already highlighted one at the top here. But there'll be some others that I want to point out as well. And I recommend you make the notes so that when you go to do the homework, you don't confuse yourself and wonder where some of these numbers came from. Now, typically, what happens with the standard step calculation? And what I'll do is I'll highlight information as we go, so that way you can see what we're covering. Typically, what happens when you want to start this calculation, usually you're given information or you assume information for the downstream elevation. So again, just looking at our previous slide very quickly, it is going to be assumed that we're given information about cross-section number one. And we're going to assume that that information is correct, say from a stream, a stream gauge, perhaps. From that information, we're going to determine 
information about the cross-section number two, particularly the water stage elevation, the cross-sectional area, the velocity, the energy losses. But in order to do that, you need to make some assumptions about the downstream cross-section. So if we go to our example, notice we are not doing cross-section number one. So the computed water stage elevation, and like I said, I'll highlight information along the way just to show you as we're moving through this table. For column number three, the computed water stage elevation for cross-section number one is going to be assumed to be correct. Also, from that information, it has already been calculated what the cross-sectional area is and how that creates a hydraulic radius. The R raised to the two-thirds is simply just a mathematical convenience. You don't have to include this column if you don't want to. The Manning's N is going to be assumed. This is something that whoever was doing the calculations assumed about Manning's N in the beginning. All of the information that we just were given would help us determine the conveyance, K. From that, if we move over to column 14, the velocity head uh, correction factor would be calculated, as well as the velocity. And then the energy head loss due to the velocity. So all of that information would be previously calculated, either by you or by another engineer, so that you can continue and move to cross-section number two. I highlight some information here down below just to show you what normally needs to be given or assumed for cross-section number two. Now, the first thing you'll need to for cross-section number two is you'll always need to know what the flow is throughout the, throughout the channel. So just like your homework, you would need to know what the flow is. If you remember from homework number two, you estimated flow using the rational method and the TR55 method. It's your choice which one you want to use for this project. You can use either estimation. But again, each person will have a unique solution because you all had different flows. So again, you're going to use your flow for, from your project. For the sake of clarity, and again, just to give you a place to start, you will be given for your homework a place to or a number to assume for your water stage elevation for column number two. So again, where do you start your calculations for cross-section two. So notice here, again, I'll highlight some of the information. For column number two, you'd have to be given somewhere to start. And again, the problem tells you that. Typically, you would have to calculate on your own the cross-sectional area. And again, the cross-sectional area for the channel, the cross-sectional area for the, fl for the floodplain. From that, you would need to calculate the wetted perimeter and that would determine the hydraulic radius. And then the hydraulic radius to the raised to the two-thirds is simply wrong. You would also be responsible for calculating, not calculating, excuse me, for determining or, or using your own judgment what you feel the best representation of Manning's N is. So that brings us all the way to column number eight. And from there, from the information that you have either been told or you determined you would estimate the conveyance or flow in the main channel as well as the floodplains. So again, just to go over that information, I'll show it to you down here as well. So again, column number two, you have to assume a water stage elevation so that you have a place to start. Again, for the project or for the homework, I give you a place to start just so that we all start consistently in the same place. Column number four, you, would e you will be told for the homework the area of the channel. In this problem, we're told the area of the channel. The area of the floodplain. So again, that's the left outer bank as well as the right over bank. From that, you would calculate the wetted perimeter which tells you the hydraulic radius of the channel, as well as the left plus the right over bank. And then column number seven, you would assume yourself what you think Manning's end should be for the channel and for the floodplains. So again, keep in mind, this information here typically needs to be 
assumed or determined before you even start. Just to show you what the cross-section looks like, this is cross-section number two. I want to define some things for you very quickly just so that you can see it. So when I refer to the area of the channel, again, we're assuming that the water stage from the previous slide we said was 517, I'm sorry, 5,712.6. So if that's the case, that means that the water stage elevation is approximately at this height which means that the cross-sectional area of the channel is located here. So this is where your 360 square feet come from. So notice that they block off, they label the area of the channel. And that has a Manning's N. Then for the area of the floodplain, that would be your, a very small area here to the left and here to the right. So again, that's what they're referring to by the different areas and the wetted perimeters associated with it. So let's start the problem. So again, so just as in your textbook, the information that's shown here is just a repeat of what we discussed. So again, just going over very quickly. So again, we were given the area of the main channel, the area of the floodplain, and the total area of the channel plus the floodplain, which gives us 440. Just, just highlighting that information. So we said that the area of section 2's main channel is 360. The area of the floodplain is 80 square feet, which means the total area is 440. Again, the main the hydraulic radius of the channel is 6.1, and the floodplain is 1.6. Again, just to highlight. Then, just calculating R to a two-thirds, and again, this is simply just to make the math easier for you later. So the add R to the two-thirds for the main channel is 3.34, and for the floodplain is 1.37. And then again, Manning's N is going to be assumed to be 0 0.03 for the main channel and 0 0.05 for the floodplain. And I'm purposely going through this and highlighting all the information so that I can point out where there are errors and where I just so you, you can follow along. So again, now that we have all the information set out, let's do some of the calculations, starting first with column 8 which is conveyance. So notice that conveyance uses Manning's equation. So the 1.49 times the cross-sectional area times the hydraulic radius raised to the two-thirds divided by Manning's N. Again, remember that this is an empirical equation. Again, that 1.49 is technically a conversion factor. Everything must be in feet and seconds so that you can get the flow into cubic feet per second. So notice going through the information, we have 1.49 times the cross-sectional area of the channel, which was 360, times the hydraulic radius raised to the two-thirds, which was already given as, already calculated, to be 3.34 divided by Manning's N, and that gives us 59,719 cubic feet per second. So we'll highlight that so that matches the value in the table are 59,719. Same thing with the floodplain, although the only difference here, we're going to notice that the area is 80 square feet and a different hydraulic radius. That gives us a total flow or conveyance of 3,266, and that matches our table. Now, I want you to notice the next piece. If you add the two conveyances, you get a total of 62,985. There's a typo in your textbook because it says 62,100. So let me take a moment. I'm going to correct that. I want to erase this real quick. Let's see if I can do it by pen. There we go. 
You want to scratch that out. I'd like to correct that. So this should actually be 62,985. A little bit of trouble writing nine eight five. So pardon my handwriting there, and that should look more like a two, which it doesn't. There we go. So sixty two nine eighty five should be the total conveyance. Now the next term and this also, let me make one more correction, this actually belongs in column number 9, not column number 10. If you want to correct this, let's just correct that and write column number 10. Bring out my pen here for just a moment for you. So this should read column number 9. And if you add, or if you take the average of um, the upstream, again, let me just show that real quick. From column number 9, if you want to take the conveyance upstream, so again, the TU stands for total conveyance upstream. If you notice, that's the 58,900. Again, that matches our number in column 8. If you take the average of the two conveyances, you have your 58,900 plus your 62,985. And again, if you take the average, you get 60,943, which matches column number 9. Again, you'll need the average conveyance in just a moment. For column number 11, you need to know the information between the distance from the upstream to downstream sections. So again, just to point that out, if we go back to our slide, a few slides back, the L that they're referring to is what is the distance, say, for example, between section 2 and section 1? What is that straight line distance along the main channel? So the assumption is that this is where the fall leg is located, the deepest portion of the channel. What is that straight line distance? So that's what they're referring to. Make sure we're up ahead enough here. There we go. So that's what they're referring to when they talk about this length of 500. So that's your length for column number 11. One thing I did notice that they did not mention in these calculations is that column number 10, which is shown up here, also isn't a calculation. It should have been listed for you as well. You need to know what the slope is between cross section 2 and cross section 1. So again, going back to your, your cross section here, you would need to know what is the elevation at the bottom of the stream bed at cross section 2 and the elevation at the bottom of cross section 1. And what is the slope from cross section 2 to cross section 1? And that slope is what is listed here. Sorry, went ahead. So the slope is 6.83 times 10 to the minus 3. So I just want you to notice that that is not shown in your textbook as the example, but it's something you would need to know or you would need to be told. In this particular example, they're just giving it to you because they did not have you calculate between the two cross sections. You could have that. So now we're going to, going to start looking at, now that we have a lot, most of our basic um, characteristics and geometries, now we're going to look at what the frictional losses are for different types of losses. The first one we're going to look at is the energy head loss. And again, this is just due to friction. And again, this is using Darcy's equation. So if you'll notice, it's what we're doing here, Darcy's equation. This is just a formatted version of Darcy's equation. So to do that, you're going to take the total flow divided by the total, total average conveyance 
between cross-section 1 and cross-section 2. That's why you calculated it. And you also need the length between the two sections. So again, Darcy's equation very much depends on how long the run or the section is or the, the distance between the two sections. That gives you a total frictional loss of 3.37 feet, which matches our column number 12. One calculation we'll do ahead of time so that it makes it easier in future calculations is we're going to look at the ratio of the conveyance cubed divided by the area squared. And we're going to do that for the main channel as well as the floodplain. And then we're going to sum them. So you're going to take the flow in the main channel, which if we go back to column number 8, is our 59,719. We're going to divide it by our area of our channel uh, squared. And that gives us our first value. Then we're going to perform the same calculation for the floodplain. So again, it's the total conveyance, the 3266 from column number 8 divided by the total area of the floodplain, which is column number four, and that gives our ratio for the floodplain. Then what you're going to do is add the two together. So that gives you a total of 1,648 times 10 to the sixth. And if we'll notice, we'll highlight some of our values again. So again, the 1568 times 10 to the sixth in column 13 matches the main channel. The 5.44 times 10 to the 6 matches the floodplain. When you add the two together, you get your 1648. Now, I want everyone to notice the one highlight I have at the top, because it's just a, a minor typographical error. The ratio is k to the third divided by a squared. But your answer will be, as you can see on the bottom right, feet to the fifth seconds cubed, which is why I believe they made that minor error of accidentally making that a 5 instead of a 3. So I just want you to realize that's just, that's just a typographical error, nothing more. Now we're going to start moving into the velocity head correction. So to do that, again, our goal is to find alpha for cross-section number 2. I'm going to highlight it for cross-section number 1, which has already been calculated to be 1.0. Now we're going to calculate it for cross-section 2. Again, to do that, you want the total area divided by the total average conveyance. So again, the total area is 440, which comes from column number 4, divided by the total average conveyance, which comes from column number 9. And then for our section in particular, the total flow was 62,985, which was column number 8. Again, remember, this should be corrected here, so 62,985, divided by the total area. That gives us a velocity correction factor of 1.1, which matches column number 14. Now that we have our alpha, we can calculate A, I'm sorry, velocity. And this is just the basic formula that we're familiar with. Q is equal to V times A where we rearrange it to solve for V. So again, notice we have our, our flow of 500 cubic feet per second divided by the total area of 440 gives us a velocity of 11.4, which again matches our column 15. Now we're going to calculate what the energy head loss is due to the velocity profile. So again, since that is not constant, again, just going back to our slide, since the velocity profile is not constant, it goes from a maximum at the free surface to a minimum if not near zero by the stream bed, we want to correct what that energy, energy head profile would be. Let's see. There we are. So when we calculate that, we use our alpha value, velocity squared, divided by 2 times the value of gravity. And that gives us a total energy loss due to velocity correction of 2.2 feet, which matches our column 16. Now we're going to try to determine whether we're experiencing a contraction from section 2 to section 1 or an expansion. So to do that for column 17, 
we're going to look at the difference between our column number 16 value for section 1 and our column number 16 value for section number 2. So notice, and again I'll highlight the values, the alpha b squared on 2g for section number 1 is 3.08 minus the alpha b squared on 2g value for section 2, which is 2.2. So again, while they show the calculations for it, this is essentially, this entire piece is essentially 3.08. So again, they were showing the calculation just for the sake of showing it to you. But it's 3.08 minus 2.2 feet. And that gives us a positive value of 1.18 feet. So if that's the case, that means we have a contraction. So again, just to highlight what we have, we have a positive 1.18 in, in column number 17. So again, since it's positive, that indicates that the velocity is increasing as you go to the downstream direction, which means you have a contraction. So you should assume a contraction coefficient of 0.1. So notice that's what we're going to do for column number 18. We're going to use our contraction coefficient of 0.1 times our alpha v squared on 2g value. And that gives us an energy loss in the contraction of 0.118 which again matches column number 18. So now with all of these pieces, what kind of change in the water elevation does that create between section number 1 and section number 2? And that's what we're calculating for column number 19. Now to do that, for column number 19, you're going to sum all of your losses. So you're going to sum the loss from column number 12, column number 17, and column number 18. So just to recap, column number 12 is the frictional head loss. Column 17 is the velocity head loss. Column 18 is the contraction or expansion energy loss. The total energy loss comes out to 4.67 feet. Now, in section number 1, the water elevation was 5,709 uh, 5, feet. But when you add the additional energy loss, it raises the water level to 4.67 feet additionally. So when you add the two together, you get a total water stage elevation or water elevation height of 5,714 feet. So when you come back to your computed water stage in column 3, also make note that there's a typo here as well. It says 513, and it actually should be 5714. Notice that that's no, I shouldn't say nowhere near, but it's not close enough. You originally assumed 5712.6, but your final iteration said 5714. By our calculation standards, that's not close enough. You if you started with 5712.6, you should have essentially gotten 5712.6. But you didn't. You got 5714. So what do you do? What you would do is you would assume a new value. So again, I'm just going to take out my pencil here so I can write myself some directions as to what I would do. Since my assumed and my computed are not close enough, they're not within 0 0.05 feet, they're not even within half a foot, that means you need to assume a new trial value for the assumed water stage elevation. And what we could assume is then we started with 5709. We added about four, four and a half feet. So if you want, you could try as your second iteration, say 
13.5 feet, or you could have assumed just 57.13. It's your choice. But again, you want to assume a new value. So what you would do, and I want you to recognize that this can be a tedious method, you would assume a new value for column number two, and you would start the calculations all over again. And the hope is that by the time you came back to your computed value in column number three, you had a good match between column number two and column number three. And I'm hoping, again, the purpose of homework number four, again, is to appreciate the amount of calculations that you have to do just to find the water stage elevation and the other properties for one cross section. And then you would continue this as you move upstream through all of your cross sections. For homework number five, you're going to move to HECRAS where the calculations will be done more efficiently for you. They'll be done in a matter of seconds where it might take you a matter of hours to do it by hand. So I want you to appreciate the tool. Again, the HECRAS is only as good as the information you input into it. So I always want you to keep that in mind. Okay. So now let's move on to some of our other topics, which I promise we could go through a bit more quickly. You will likely run, if you do any sort of drainage work, you will run into stormwater collection and sewer design. Some things that you want to keep in mind is that storm sewers, typically from homes and apartment buildings and not main, uh, not main sewers, are typically designed for the 10-year storm. And the reason why is that these are just individual pipes that serve maybe one singular home or one apartment building. So you don't want to design it to any really exceeding standard because it will become too costly. You also want to make sure that the velocities are between 2 to 10 feet per second. Now why is that? As you can see, you can see flow in this bottom right sewer pipe or sewer drain. If the velocity is lower than 2 feet per second, any of the sediment that's in the water will settle out and you'll start to clog the pipe. So you want to maintain a self-flushing velocity. That's what that means. But at the same time, you don't want it to be too high, say greater than, much greater than 10 feet per second, because any sand or gritty material in this flow will actually start to wear away. It'll essentially start to scour or scrub away the concrete material of the pipe. So again, you don't want to do that either because then you'll be destroying your pipe over time. Another term that you'll look for is the appropriate amount of cover. You usually look for at least three feet of cover above the crown. Now where is the crown? In your typical pipe, the crown is known as the top of the pipe. The invert is known as the bottom of the pipe. Typically the crown is the elevation on the inner diameter where the invert is the elevation of the lower diameter, where the spring line is the center line of the pipe. So you typically look for three feet above the pipe so that you have appropriate amount of cover for, free, for freezing and thawing. Again, if you, in colder climates, you would have even more cover, say four, five, six feet. And the reason why is that you don't want the pipe to experience cracking when water around the pipe starts to freeze. So if all the freezing is occurring above, you don't have to worry about that. Also, pipes are designed using Manning's equation. As you can see, there's a large portion that's open to the atmosphere in this pipe. It's not a closed pipe system. It's not a pressurized system. So it's designed using Manning's equation. One, another example that you would have to look at is what we call gutter flow. So again, if you're looking at, say, a roadway or, say, any sort of um, open area that you're trying to collect flow and you want to keep, say, maybe a large parking lot, you want to make sure that the water doesn't pond in an area so that people don't have to walk through puddles or so that if you're riding a car, you don't hydroplane. You'll notice that you'll put the surface at a slope. Again, typically the top of, say, a roadway is known as a crown, just like a pipe, and then it's sloped on either end. It'll go into an inlet area, and we'll do that in just a moment. We'll calculate flows through inlets. But the gutter is the area that runs perpendicular. So again, I can't show it to you, so it's the area running in and out of the slide. That's known as the gutter. 
and two different types of slopes that exist. First, we said there's the cross slope. This is the slope that's facing you. And that's to promote water to move into the inlet, or in, I'm sorry, into the gutter. But then there's also a longitudinal slope, which, as I said, is in and out of the board with the gutter. And again, that's to move the flow through gravitational energy from a higher elevation to a lower elevation. That lower elevation could be, say, a, um, a gutter, a sewage drain, or maybe just an area where you're going to have the water collect and drain out. The triangle that I'm showing here is typically how you calculate the flow area of a gutter. Just to show you that, that's this triangular area here. You can visualize that as approximately a triangle. And the same here. This is your gutter. The gutter typically has a maximum depth, shown here, typically of six inches. That's pretty standard, because that's the height of a curve. So again, if you're looking out and about, you'll see that the maximum height of a curve is typically six inches or less. If you wanted to find this flow through a gutter, you would calculate it using the empirical equation of 0.4. Again, that coefficient is determined in the laboratory. 1 divided by Manning's n times the cross slope times the depth, which is typically a max of 6 inches, divided by the square root of the cross-sectional slope, of the longitudinal slope, excuse me. So that's just one example. Next, I'd like to talk about different types of inlets along the gutter. So as you can see, again, in the top left photo, this is a gutter. So this is that triangular shape at the side of a roadway. Periodically along a gutter, you'll have a storm drain inlet. So here's an example of a storm drain inlet. This is an example of a curb inlet. You could also have what's called a grate inlet. And as you can see, the grate, and that lays horizontal, or it's along the roadway. And this is an example of a grate inlet. Or you can actually have a combination. As you can see, here's an example in the drive where you have your curve inlet at the top vertically and your grate inlet horizontally. And again, you would just analyze them by combining them together. The example on the bottom left is an example with actual flow. So you have flow moving through the gutter and all of the flow upstream of the inlet flows into the inlet. All of the flow downstream flows to the next gutter, I'm sorry, the next inlet. So if you're calculating the flow for a curb, it would be the flow is equal to 1.27 times the length times the height raised to the 1.5. If you want to find the flow for a great inlet, it's equal to 1.66 times 2 times the width plus 2 times the length. And the depth, like we said, is typically about one, 6 inches or half a foot raised to the 1.5. If you want to calculate for a combination inlet, you just add the two together. So let's do a brief example of a great inlet. And I'll do this alongside with, with the problem. So if you want to calculate the capacity or flow of a 3 foot by 2 foot great inlet, if the maximum flow depth at the gutter is 6 inches. So Q is equal to 1.66, 2 times the width, which in this case is 2 feet, plus 2 times the length, which is 3 feet. Typically, the length is longer so that you capture more flow, times the depth, which we said was 6 inches. But again, since this is an empirical equation, you want to make sure you answer everything in feet and seconds. I'll give you all a moment. If you'd like to calculate it yourself, just press pause. You should have gotten approximately 5.9 cubic feet per second. So that's the flow into each inlet. So you would compare the total flow of the gutter, and you would want to make sure you have enough inlets to capture all of that flow. So what 
are some other hydraulic structures or hydraulic devices that we'll need to consider? Another is a spillway. Typically, you'll see a spillway as part of a dam. And the purpose of a spillway is to allow additional or excess flow to move downstream. So as an example, as you can see the reservoir behind the spillway dam, if there's a storm event and they're expecting there to be too much precipitation that might threaten and cause the, the flow to overtop the dam and the spillway, the spillway would open and allow flow to exit ahead of time so that you don't affect the people downstream. Here's another example, say, for a small residential community. If they have a small, say, pond area that they want to maintain, either just because it's a wetland area and there's some species they want to keep, or maybe it's just for aesthetic reasons, during times of heavy precipitation, they'll want the excess to be removed and to go into a storm drain. So again, this would go into the spillway. This is an example of what we call a peripheral weir, meaning that it's around the periphery of the circle, so it can flow on any edge of the circle into the drainage, into the drain. Where for these two, you'll typically find shapes, which we'll talk about next, different types of weirs. Weirs are very common ways to regulate the amount of flow that exists in a spillway. The three types that you'll typically see that are shown here, this is the rectangular weir, the V-notch or triangular weir, which is shown here as an example. You may remember from last semester when you did fluid mechanics, you actually calibrated a rectangular weir and a triangular weir. The only one you did not calibrate was the Cipolletti or a trapezoidal weir. The Cipolletti is a specific name given to a trapezoidal weir if the slope is at a 45 degree angle. Or another way of saying that, as I've shown here, is a one-to-one -one slope which means a one vertical to a one horizontal, which is the same as 45 degrees. So let's do an example where we calculate maybe, say, a property that we need of a weir. Because again, a weir helps us control flow such that it'll only a certain amount of flow will move over, say, a dam or a spillway that we want. So for example number three, it says estimate the weir length necessary for a water elevation of 101, so again, if this is the water elevation at 101, MSL stands for mean sea level, and it says that the crest of the weir, meaning this is actually the top of the weir, this is the top of the flow. So the top of the flow is at 101, the top of the, or crest of the weir is at 100, and the flow through this weir is 100 cubic feet per second. So we're being asked to find what is the width of the weir necessary to convey that flow. So let's try calculating that. So we have Q, and I'm going to try to solve for B directly. So Q divided by 3.3 times V to the 3 on 2, or I could say the 1.5, is equal to B. So let's see what that gives me. So we said my Q is 100 CFS. I'm going to divide that by 3.3 times, now again, the the depth is 101 feet minus 100. Now I'm just going to say raised to the 1.5 instead of 3 divided by 2. I'll give you a moment to calculate that. Again, if you want, you can also pause the video. Hopefully you got a value of 30.3 feet. So that needs to be the length of the weir to, con to convey that flow. Our last topic today is culvert design. Again, this is just a very, very, very general overview 
one, to identify what a culvert is, and two, just what are some main design concerns when you design a culvert. So again, a culvert is anything less than 20 feet in diameter. So again, each of these are less than 20 feet in diameter. And typically, a culvert is a passage for flow above, say, a small or perhaps a large what, uh, roadway. If a culvert is underneath a main highway, you're going to design it for the 100-year storm. And the reason why is that if a main highway is an important structure. And if that structure were to fail, that would affect a lot of people. Where for secondary roads, you design it for a 50-year storm because if there's a failure, it affects far less people. It is assumed to be flowing partially full. And the reason for that is so that you can assume, so again, as you can see in this sketch right here, it's not flowing full so that you can assume it has atmosphere conditions, so that the pressure is that of the atmosphere. It's not a pressurized system. Usually, a recommendation is to keep at least a foot of freeboard. What that means is that from the crown to the water surface elevation, there should be about a foot. And again, depending on the culvert diameter, this may or may not be. So finally, I have an extra credit teaser for you. As you saw before, I had this in my slide as a picture of a manhole. And this is an elevation of typically what's underneath a manhole. My question to you is, why are manholes round? The first person to email me, so instead of Blackboard, the first person to email me the correct answer will receive extra credit. So again, what is the reason why a manhole is round, as opposed to square, triangular, trapezoidal, any other shape? Why is it a circle? So again, I leave that for you as an extra credit teaser, something to think about. Last but not least, what do you need to do? Please keep in mind that you need to take the quiz before the due date. Please check the quiz for that due date. And second, homework number four, which is due a week from today. So again, keep in mind that the homework is due the following week. And this is just a draft. If you want me to make any comments to you, I would like to see it within a week. And then we will meet soon after that for you to finalize it. Again, thank you very much. And I hope you all had a great week. And I will see you soon. Take care.